Hello guys, welcome back to RTs Around. And now we have started a new thing called Bookcast. So today our book is, the first book that we are going with is Pierre Carmel. Pierre Carmel, the perfect mentor, has been written for you, for that moment in your life when you need to decide between light and darkness. You may thread the path that leads to light, or if you wish, take the path that ends in darkness. Let's start with the first chapter. My life's dearest desire, she fell into deep thought, the pen between her lips. Then drawing a deep breath, she gave a wan smile. Hard to say. Why is that? Javeria asked her. Because I desire so many things, and each, of, each one of them is so important for me, she replied, shaking her head. They were both sitting at the further end of auditorium, their backs to their wall. It was their eighth day at the FSC classes and they spent their free period here, nibbling salted peanuts one by one. Javeria repeated her question. What's your life's dearest wish, Imama? Imama looked at her with some surprise and pondered over the question. Then praying the question with a demand, she said, you tell me first what you desire the most. I asked you first, you, so you should reply first, retorted Javeria. Very well, let me think. Mama conceded defeat. My life's dear, dearest desire, she mumbled to herself. Well, one wish is to live long, very long, she said. Why? Javeria laughed. Fifty or sixty years are too short for me. One should live to be at least a hundred. And then there is so much I wish to do. Should I die early? All my wishes should remain unfulf unfulfilled. She popped a peanut into her mouth. What else? said Javeria. I want to be the most outstanding doctor in the century, the best eye specialist, so that when the history of eye surgery in Pakistan is compiled, my name will be at the top of the list. She looked up with a smile. And what if you cannot become a doctor? After all, that depends upon merit and luck, Javeria stated. That is out of question. I'm working so hard to make it to the merit list. Beside my parents, can afford to send me abroad if I don't get into a medical college here. But still, what if you cannot be a doctor? That's impossible. It's my life's dearest desire. I can sacrifice everything for it. This has been my lifelong dream. And how can one just ignore or forget one's dream? Impossible, Imama shook her head. Decisively, as she picked another peanut, off her palm and nibbled on it. Nothing is impossible in life. Anything can happen at any time. Suppose your wish does not come true. How would you react? Imama fell into thought again. To begin with, I will weep a lot, a great deal, for many days, and then I will die. Javeria burst out, laughing. You just said you wanted a very long life, and now you want to die? Obviously, what's the point of living then? All my plans are built around my career in medicine. And if that is not a part of my life, then what remains? So that means this one dream of your life will wipe out all other dreams? Yes, think of it that way. Your most desire, important desire is to be a doctor, not to live long. You could say so. Very well. So if you can't become a doctor, then how would you choose to die? Would you choose suicide or a natural death? A natural death, of course. I can't kill myself, Imama replied casually. And if you do not die naturally, then what? I mean, if you do not die soon despite not being a doctor, you would go on living. No, I mean that I will die very soon if I can't be a doctor. I will be so heartbroken, I will not survive. She replied decisively. It is difficult to believe that a cheerful person like you can be so despairing as to cry yourself to death. And that too just because you were unable to pursue a medical career. Sounds funny mocked Javeria. Stop talking about me. Tell me about yourself. What's your heart's dearest desire? Imama ch changed the subject. Let it go. Why let it go? Come on, tell me. You will be offended if I say it. Javeria spoke hesitantly. Imama turned around in surprise to look at her. Why would I be offended? Javeria was quiet. What is it that I will mind? Imama repeated her question. You will, Javeria murmured. What should you realize? Greatest wish so affect my life that I would get upset. Imama was irritated. Is it your wish that I do not become a doctor? Imama seemed to suddenly remember. Oh no, Javeria laughed. 
There is more to life than being a doctor, she stated philosophically. Stop talking in riddles and answer me, Imama said firmly. I promise I will not mind anything you say. She held out her hand in a gesture of peace. Regardless of your promise, you are going to be very angry when you hear what I have to say. Let's talk about something else, Javier replied. All right, let me guess. Your decision is linked to something of great value to me, right? Imama said after a thoughtful pause. Javier nodded her head. The question is why it is so important to me that I should... She stopped in mid-sentence. But unless I know the nature of your wish, I cannot come to a conclusion, Javeria. Please tell me. The suspense is too much for me, she pleaded. Javeria was lost in thought. Imama studied her face. Javeria looked up at her for after a while. Other than my career, there is only one thing I value most in my life, Imama addressed her. And if you want to say something in that context, then say so. I won't mind, Imama was serious. Javeria was taken aback. Imama looked at her ring on her hand. A smile caused Javeria's face. My life's dearest desire is that you, Javeria revealed her thoughts. Imama's face went white with shock. Javeria could not guess the impact her words had on Imama, but the expression on her face showed the reaction was much more intense than she had expected. I did tell you that you would be offended, Javeria tried to redeem the situation. But Imama strayed back without a word. Moise wa was howling with pain, doubled up and holding on to his stomach. The 12-year-old boy facing him wiped the blood off his nose on the sleeve of his torn shirt and swung the tennis racket in his hand to hit Moise on the leg. Moise let out another scream and strengthened up. With disbelief, he looked at his brother, younger by two years, who was hitting him with the same racket that Moise had bought there. This was the third time they had fought this week, and every time it was his younger brother who, start, who started the fight. He and Moise had never had a good relation and had fought since childhood, but their quarrels had mostly been verbal and included threats, but of late they had become physical. This is what happened today. They had come back from school together. When they got down from the car, the younger brother roughly dragged his bag out, the, out of the boot as Moise was picking up his school bag. In the process, he bruised Moise's hand, making him wince with pen. Have you gone blind? Moise cried out as his brother walked off. He heard Moise turn, uh, turned round, looked at him, then opened the front door and walked into the lounge. In sense, Moise follows on his, he on his heels. The next time you do anything like that, I will break your hand, Moise shouted. The younger boy took his bag off his shoulder, put it down with hands on his hips, faced Moise. I will. So what will you do? Break my hand? Have you had the cuts? You will find out if you repeat what you did today, Moise headed towards the room. But his brother stopped him, grabbing his bag with all his strength. No, tell me. He flung Moise back down, flushed with anger. Moise picked up his brother's bag and hurled it away without a pause. His brother landed a sharp blow on Moise's leg. Moise lunged at him, punching his face, and his nose began to bleed. Despite that, there was no sound from the younger boy. He grabbed Moise's tie and tried to choke him. Moise retaliated by grabbing his collar. There was a tearing sound as his shirt ripped. With all his force, Moise hit his brother on his midrib, so as to make him lose his grip on him. Now I will show you. I will break your hand, shouting and abusing. Moise picked up the tennis racket that was lying in the corner of the lounge. The next thing he knew was that the racket was in his, in his brother's hand and was sunk with such force that Moise could not sa save himself. Blows rained down on him on his back and legs. The older brother came into the lounge in a fit of rage. What is your problem? You create an upheaval as soon as you get home. At the sound of his voice, the younger brother first lowered and then raised the racket again. And you? Aren't you ashamed of yourself for raising your hand at your older brother? The eldest brother looked at him, holding the racket. No, he retorted without any remorse. He threw the racket down, picked up his back, and walked away. You will have to pay for this, Moise called out after him, rubbing his sore leg. Sure, why not? He gave Moise a weird smile. Get it back the next time. It was no fun hitting you with a tennis racket. No bones are broken. Check out your nose. It's broken for sure, furious. Moise looked towards the staircase where his brother had been studying just a while ago. 
For the fourth time, Mrs. Samantha Richards, Richards stared at the boy sitting on the first chair in the second row by the window. With complete disregard for the class, he was busy staring out of the window. From time to time, he would look at Mrs. Richards and then turn back to the, the view from the window. This was her first day as biology teacher at one of the international schools in Islamabad. She was a diplomat's wife and a teacher by profession. They had recently arrived in Islamabad. At all her husband's posting, she had taken up teaching assignments in the schools attached to the embassy. Continuing the slavers and teaching schedule of Mr. of her predecessor, Miss Mariam, after a brief introduction to the class, Mrs. Richards began explaining the function of the herd and the circulation system and drew a diagram on the board. She looked at a student who was looking distractly out of the window. Using a time-worn technique, she fixed her gaze on him and stopped speaking. A hush fell over the class. The boy ran back to the class, meeting his gaze. Mrs. Richards smiled and resumed her lecture. For a while, she continued to keep her gaze on the boy who was now busy writing in his notebook. Then she turned her attention to the class. She believed the boy who was embarrassed not, embarrassed not to let his attention wander. But just a couple minutes later, she found him looking out of the window again. Once more, she stopped her lecture and he turned to look at her. This time, she did not smile. She continued addressing the class. As she turned to the writing board, the student again turned to the window. A look of annoyance crossed her face and she fell silent again. The boy looked at her with a fawn and looked away beyond the window. His attitude was so insulting that Mrs. Samantha Richard's face flushed. Salar, what are you looking at? She asked sternly. Nothing came the one word reply. and gave her a piercing look. Do you know what I'm teaching? Hope so. His tone was so rude that Samantha Richards capped the marker she had in her hand, slept it down on the table. If that is so, then come up here and draw, the, draw and label this diagram. She raised a figure on the board. The boy's face changed a myriad color. She saw the students in the class exchange glances. The boy stared coldly at Samantha Richards as she cleaned the last trace of her diagram from the boy, from the board. He left his seat. Moving swiftly, he picked up the marker from the table with lightning speed. In exactly two minutes and 57 seconds, he had drawn and labeled the diagram. Replacing the cap on the marker, he slammed it down on the table just as Mrs. Richards had done and without looking at her, returned to his seat. Mrs. Richards did not see him tossing down the marker or walking back to his seat. He was looking in disbelief at the diagram which has taken her 10 minutes to make and which he had completed in less than three minutes. It was far better than her work. She could not find even a minor flaw in it. Somewhat embarrassed, she looked to find. Uh, she turned to look at the boy. Once again, he was looking out of the window. Wasim knocked on the door for the third time. This time, he could not bear Imama inside. And hear Imama inside. Who is it? Imama, it's me. Open the door and Wasim standing back. There was silence on the other side. A little later, the lock clicked and Wasim turned the doorknob to enter. Imama moved towards her back with her back to Wasim. What brings you here at this time? Why did you turn in so early? It's only 10 now, replied Wasim and he's as he walked in. I was sleepy. She sat down on the bed. Wasim was alarmed to see her. Have you been crying? It was a spontaneous remark. Imama's eyes were red and swollen and she was trying to look away. No, no, I wasn't crying. Just a bad headache. She tried to smile. Wasim, sitting down beside her, beside her, held her hand, trying to check her temperature. Any fever? He asked with some concern, then let go of her hand. You don't have fever. Perhaps you should take a tablet for your headache. I have. Good. Go to sleep then. I had come to talk to you, but you are in no state. Wasim turned to leave the room. Mama made no effort to stop him. She followed him to the door and shut it behind him. Flinging herself on the bed, she buried her face in the pillow. She was sobbing again. The 13-year-old boy was engrossed in a music show on TV when Tayyaba peeped in. She looked at her son somewhat uncertainly and entered the room irritated. What's going on? I'm watching TV, he replied without looking at her. Watching TV? For God's sake, are you aware that your exams have started? 
Tayyiba started asked, standing in front of him. So what? He said, annoyed. So what? You should be in your room with your books, not sitting here watching this vulgar show. Tayyiba scolded him. I have studied as much as I need to. Now please move out of my way. His tone reflected his irritation. All the same, go in and study. Tayyiba stood her ground. No, I will not get up, nor will I go in and study. My studies and papers are my concern, not yours. If you're concerned about your study, will you be sitting here? Tayyiba said. Step aside, he ignored Tayyiba's comment and rudely shooed her away. Shoot her away. I'm going to talk to your father today, Tayyiba tried to threat. You can talk to him for all I care. What will happen? He, what is he going to do? I've told you that I've already prepared for my exams. So then what's your trouble? This is your final examination. You should be concerned about it, Tayyiba softened her tone. I'm not a four-year who, who you need to nag. I have a better understanding of my responsibilities than you. So don't pester me with your silly advice. Your exams are on. Pay attention to your studies. You should be in your room. I will have a word with your father. What rubbish. Standing up, he flung the remote control at the wall and stopping his feet, he left the room. The Yeba helpless and humiliated watched him go. It was New Year's Eve. 30 minutes to go before the new year began. A group of 10 or so teenagers were roaming around the city streets on their motorbikes doing all kinds of stunts. Some of them wore shiny headbands to celebrate the coming year. An hour ago, they were in one of the uptown supermarkets teasing girls with whistles. They had fire fire firecrackers too, which they, had, they let off to celebrate. At a quarter to twelve, they reached the parking lot of the Jim Khanna Club, where a New Year's party was in full swing. The boys also had invitations to the party, and their parents were already there. When they got in, it was five to midnight. In a few moments, the lights in the hall and the dance floor would be switched off, and then, with a display of fireworks on the lawn, the new year would be heralded in. The party would be on all night, dancing, drinking, all the fest festivity specially organized for the occasion by the Gymkhana management. Lights off meant a display of complete abandon. That was what the crowds came for. One of the teenagers who had joined the party was on the dance floor, rocking to the beat and impressing all with his performance. At 10 seconds to 12, the light went off, light, lights went off. Voices and laughter filled the hall as people counted the seconds to the new year, and this rose to a pitch as the clock struck midnight and the hall lit up again. The teenagers were now in the parking lot, their cars' horns blaring away. Beer can in hand, the youth who was on the dance floor got on the roof of the car. He pulled out an other beer can from his jacket and pitched it at the windscreen of a park cart, which shattered with an explosion as full uh, can hit it. He stood on the car, calmly drinking from the can of beer in his hand. For the last hour, Salar had been watching Kamran trying to master the video game. The score remained the same, probably because Kamran was trying to maneuver a difficult track. Salar was also in the lounge, busy writing notes. From time to time, we would look at the TV screen as Kamran struggled to win more points. Half an hour later, Salar put his notebook away, stifled a yawn, stretched his le legs out on the table, and crossing his hands behind his head, looked at the TV screen as Kamran started a new game. Having lost a previous round, what's the problem, Kamran? Nothing. I got this game. New game, and it is really tough to score, Kamran said in a tired tone. Let me see. Salar got up from the sofa and took the remote control. Kamran watched silently in the opening seconds. Salar was racing at a speed that Kamran had never reached. The drag that had challenged Kamran was like child's play for Salar. It was hard for Kamran to keep his eyes on the car that was racing at a fantastic speed in the first minute, in the first minute, and yet Salar had complete control over it. Three minutes later, Kamran saw the car swerve, go off the track, and explode in smithrins. Kamran turned to Salar with a smile. He realized why the car has been destroyed. Laying the remote control down on the table, Salar picked up his notebook. It's very boring game, he remarked as he jumped over Kamran's legs and went out. Kamran clenched his teeth as the seven-digit score appeared on the screen. He looked at the door as Salar left. They were both quiet once again. 
Ashit was beginning to worry. Imama had always been as withdrawn as she was now. One could have counted the words she had spoken the, in the last hour. He had known her since childhood. She was a lively girl. In the first year after her engagement, Ashit had felt happy in her company. She was so quick-witted and vivacious, but in the last few years she had changed and the transformation had become more pronounced since she started medical school. Ashit felt she had something on her mind. At times she would appear to be worried and sometimes she was distinctively cool and distant, as though she wanted to end their meeting and leave as soon as possible. This time too he had the same feeling. I often think that this is I who insist on our meetings. Perhaps it makes a little difference to you whether we meet or not, he said. She was sitting on a garden chair across him looking at the creepers on the boundary wall. At, at Ashish's remark, she fixed her gaze on him. He cast an inquiring glance, but she was silent, so he, so he rephrased his words. My coming here makes no difference to you, Imama. Eh, Am I right? What can I say? At least you can say no, you're mistaken. Mm-hmm. No, you are mistaken, Imama eh, cut him short. Her tone was cold and her expression was as different as before. Ashish signed in despair. Yes, I wish and pray that it may be so, that I may be indeed mistaken. However, talking to you, I feel you do not care. What makes you think so? Ashja detected a note of annoyance, annoyance in her tone. Many things for one, you never respond properly to anything I say. I do make effort to reply properly to whatever you say. What can I do if you do not like what I have to say? Ashja felt that she was more annoyed. I did not mean that I did not like what you say. It's only that you only say yes or no in response. Sometimes I feel as if I'm talking to myself. When you ask me if I'm well, I say yes or no. What else can I say? You, If you want to hear a spiral in response to a simple question, then ask me what you would like to hear and I'll say it. She was serious. You could add something to that yes or no. If nothing else, ask me how I am. Ask you how you are. You're sitting across me, talking to me. Obviously, you're quite well. Otherwise, you'd be at home in bed sick. Imama, these are formalities, and you know very well I do not believe in formalities. There is no need to ask me how I am. I will not mind at all. Ashid was specious. Fine. Normal. Formalities aside, one can talk of other things, discuss something, talk to each other, what interests us, what keep us busy. Ashid, what can I discuss with you? You are a businessman. I am a medical student. What should I ask you about the stock market position? Was the trend bullish or bearish? Or by high, how many points did you in, did the index rise? Or why are you sending? Uh, when are you sending the next consignment? How much rebate did the government give you this time? She went on coldly. Or shall I discuss anatomy with you? What effects? Uh, what are effects the function of the liver? What new techniques have been used for bypass surgery this year? What should be the voltage of electric shot given to a restorer failing heart? These are our spares of work. So what points? Of discussion can we hear about these these will help us to achieve love and familiarity i fail to understand the color of Ashish's face deepened he was cursing the moment he had complained to a mama there are other interests too in a person's life he said weakly no besides my studies there are no interests in my life imama said decisively shaking her head for emphasis after all, we shared interest early on. Forget about what happened earlier, Imama interjected. I cannot afford to waste time now. What surprises me is that despite you business, you being a businesswoman, you're a businessman, you are so immature and emotional. You should be more practical. Ashit was silent. You should know our relationship. If you think, if you think my pra- a practical approach to our relationship shows a lack of interest or indifference, then I cannot do much about it. That I am here with you means I value this relationship. Otherwise, I would not be here sitting having tea with a stranger. She paused a moment and continued. And whether you coming here or make uh, or not makes any difference to me, the answer is that we are both very busy people. We are products of a modern age. I am no he who waits upon you with delicacies while you play the flute. Nor are you Ranja who will indulge me for hours. The truth is that it really makes no difference whether or not we meet or talk. Our relationship, as it is today, will continue, or do you feel it will change? If Astrid's bro, bro did not sweat, it was simply because it was the month of December. 
There was difference of eight years in their ages, but for her the first time, Ashit felt it was not eight but eighteen, and she was the older one. Just two weeks ago, she had turned nineteen, but to him it seemed as if she had raced overnight from teenage to middle age, and he had regressed to his preteens. She said across him, leg crossed, eyes fixed on his face, waiting for his response. Ashit looked at the engagement ring on her finger and cleared his throat. You're right. I just thought we should chat more because it would. Help us develop some understanding between us, Ashit. I know and understand you very well. I'm disappointed to learn that you think we still need to develop an understanding between us. I thought there already was a good deal of understanding. Ashit had to accept that it wasn't his day. And if you think that talking about business and anatomy will improve the situation, then very well. We will do that in future. There was an element of disinterest in Imama's tone. You're not not happy with I said, with what I said. Why should I be unhappy? This embarrassed him further. Perhaps I said the wrong thing. Not perhaps, but certainly I said the wrong thing. He repeated the last phrase with emphasis. You know how important this relationship is for me. I have many dreams for the future. He took a deep breath. Continued. She continued to stare, expressionless, at the creeper along the along the wall. Perhaps that is why I am so sensitive about it. I have no fears about us. This engagement took place at our consent. His fix, uh, his gaze was fixed on her, and he spoke with emotion. But suddenly, he felt once more that she was not there, and he was talking to himself.